welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. This happens to be our 209th episode. And we're broadcasting live uh, from actually two different locations. Well, I mean, to be perfectly correct, three different locations, but two locations are pretty close to each other. So our most remote place from Hawaii is in Long Beach, California, with hospitality uh, design legend, uh, Ron Lindgren. Good to have you back, Ron. Hello. And we have my buddy DeSoto Brown over at the foothills of Diamond Head at your childhood's home, Aussie Puff Design. Hi, DeSoto. Right. Hello, everybody. And welcome back, Martin, because now you are just a stone's throw from me back in Waikiki, albeit confined by quarantine for COVID, but we don't want to get into that discussion because it's too traumatic. Yeah, and I'm, I could, I could, I'm allowed to wave at you from my lanai if you yeah. take out your magnifying glasses. That's you could, right. You see me, right. <laughs> That's uncontagious, by the way. You don't have to. Yeah, don't get me going. So how can I now not share my trauma with you? But so anyways, we're, we're broadcasting within one of the most challenges of at least our generation, if not mankind. The, the most critical one is climate change. And the second one is the ongoing uh, uh, coronavirus uh, COVID uh, situation. So uh, that being said, um, I think we can only solve that if we are thinking of ourselves being one world and all being from that one world and not trying to blame others or uh, block ourselves off. Uh, my fellow Europeans, by the way, aren't even supposed to be here and they aren't because uh, even the Biden administration hasn't been undoing the blocking the Europeans from coming. And only because I'm also American and I teach here, I was allowed to come back and bring my recently married wife, who I now spoil with uh, quarantining in the Waikiki Grand Hotel that never had a kitchen. Uh, so that sounds rather good. That's what, we, what you wanted me to talk about, right? So no, no, no. no. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so uh, getting our spirit back up, uh, cutting the curve back to our discipline and um, effectively profession is that we're also back here with hospitality. And that doesn't get us back because I'm, I'm thinking about everyone who gets let in there. You know, all the countries, you need like an, an antigene test or whatever. And then you're running around here with, if, if you have a mask, you have some kind of self-made cotton mask or whatever. In Europe, I have to say where I came from, PCR tests are the only proven who particularly keep away the, the tragic Delta variant. So then, you know, people sneaking in there and just like behaving irresponsibly and us having done the suspender and belt, uh, PCR tests, negative proved and vaccination from the World Health Organization being locked down here is pretty rather ironic. So again, I'm thinking, you know, we should, you know, really, you know, get together more globally and figure things out all together. That's basically our message. And also, as we said, you know, this, uh, the tourism as our number one income, which also feeds me, by the way, in all respect, I have to be fair to that, is back to business, but it's also back to normal. So have we learned anything from it, how vulnerable we are? If that breaks away, the next thing could be climate crisis related the next hurricane right we, we should make uh, nature so angry so shouldn't we get back to self-sufficiency where your ancestors to soda have been pretty fast to be not as vulnerable and that's our point and so us being the panel comprised of one of the most excellent hospitality architects me the practicator of architecture and you to sort of the historian let's look first uh, further into the past to project out in the future, what, what can we do better? And this is uh, also a part of uh, uh, the last uh, four volumes of comparing Europe's Hawaii Madeira to our Hawaii here, the Polynesian Hawaii. And uh, we uh, promised that we're gonna compare pieces of architecture and we're gonna do four more shows. Two compares uh, hotels from the turn of the century, which is the Moana Surfrida, and the Royal Hawaiian here and the Reed Hotel over there. But mid-century, gets, uh, which gets some of us, even us Dokomomoas, as uh, you know, that's how we all met each other in person at the National Symposium. What is it, two years ago? 
uh, even more is mid-century, and there is the Pestana Park Hotel by the famous Brazilian architect Oscar Niemeyer in Madeira, and the equivalent zeitgeist wise and year of build uh, is the project we want to talk about today. So that gets us to the first slide, please. And this is the zeitgeist content of that one, because we're talking about the early uh, 60s where, you know, America for me was the holy land because you guys did everything we only dreamed of. Uh, for example, shooting people to the moon, as you can see here. And this time is still sort of visible here through what I also uh, got obsessed with in my childhood driving with in the sandbox with my little Straßenkreuzers. They're still here. And there's a little preview of our uh, future continuation of our automobile architecture comparison shows, uh, which we will share with you pretty soon again. And there is a 1966 built car, a Fury on that one. Thanks, Michael, for zooming in on uh, just next door, uh, basically here, uh, Alawai Street. And then below that, we really like the color match between that uh, gold thing of the Apollo 1 to the left, and then uh, in the middle on the right, the Alamoana building, if um, uh, when we see that. Alamoana building was built also in the early 60s as one of the first beacons of, of, of just new uh, statehood. And not that it is about us, but we want you, the audience, immerse yourself into this time, particularly the year 1966, where you were and using us as examples. So the gentleman in the, in the green, white, Aloha shirt, please explains who he is and where he was at that point in 66. Well, um, that's a picture of me. And, and uh, Michael, you can go down to the, the bottom there. You can see the three pictures in the lower right. There, there, there are the people who are on the screen with you right now. And that's me, uh, 11 years old, 1965. Um, and I'm at the location where we are going to be later on as we continue our discussion. But I was just a 11 year old and uh, Ron, you were a grown up and you were doing something far more significant than what I was doing. Tell us what that was. And that's the most handsome gentleman to the right of you, Gustavo, just that's so right. the audience right. knows with your uniform. Right. So where and when was that, Ron? Yeah, 1966, it was certainly a year for me. I had gotten my graduate degree from MIT. I was 25 years old and in the very last month of the Vietnam draft, I got the call to serve the military. And so that picture is of myself at the Naval Candidate, uh, Naval Officers Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island, where I spent uh, 16 weeks uh, becoming a military officer. And I must say that even I don't look too bad in Naval whites, because almost anyone does. Well, and that gets us to the, um, to the third one, last but least. And I leave it up talking, looking good. I leave this up to you to explain who that is because you got that great right. laugh out of it. I did, I did. So, so Michael, let's go back to that picture. Just a minute, let me make sure my telephone is turned off. Let's go back to that picture. And there, in the bottom picture, you see, doesn't look like there's anybody in that picture, but there's a little white thing right in the center. That is little baby Martin Disfang in Germany in a baby carriage being seen through a window. He is outside on a covered lanai, as we would say here. He's got a fuzzy white hood on and he has a pacifier in his mouth. And when I finally realized who that was uh, yesterday, when I was looking at the pictures, I laughed for minutes because it is such a kooky picture of a very little baby. So Ron was a grown up, I was a kid, and uh, Martin was just a newborn. All right, so audience, where were you at that time if you were already around? And mm -hmm. now we're gonna take you to the place. And also, I mean, all the three pictures tell you about, which we're gonna address in the longest in the making and probably most relevant show, the Soto, which is about skins, our human skin, and then the additional clothing skin we throw over, and then the, facades we wrap around us and their relationships. And we call it address code, address code. That's at least the plan. So you can see, Ron, you're in the, uh, in the tempered East and you're you know, uh, dressed appropriately. Obviously, minus tempered too. Again, at least we have a lanai 
that's probably where my sympathy and enthusiasm about lanai has you know been given to me with a mother milk although i have a sweet sucking sucker maggie there in my mouth at that yeah. point right yeah. but it's also not that warm at that time when they pick, took the picture you know that's why they put this sort of wig on me which i probably should could wear now these days again right so again there's climate and culture and architecture so it gets us to the next slide and you tell us which climate and culture uh, that is we're looking okay. at well now we're going to the big island uh hawaii island and there is a whole history, which maybe people are not aware of, of cowboy culture here in, in the Hawaiian Islands. And it is similar to, but not identical to, the cowboy culture of North America, because of course, that extends not only from the United States, but it's part of, it's part of Canada as well. So moving cattle around in great open spaces where they are grazing is a technique <laughs> that was developed in North America and Mexico, and it spread here to the Hawaiian Islands. And the site that you're looking at is part of, you can see the ocean in the background in a very um, rocky lava landscape with a hollow tree, but there are Hawaiian cowboys with cattle. And um, Ron, you wanted to talk about that whole syndrome as well. Tell us about that. Yeah, when we talk about Hawaiian cowboys, we're talking about going back to the 1700s. Uh, and in fact, uh, the reign of King Kamehameha. Uh, the famous British captain, uh, George Vancouver, brought five cows over across the ocean to Hawaii in 1788. And now on the Big Island and near the project we're going to talk about is the Parker Ranch on the Big Island, 130,000 acres. First time I visited Parker Ranch, I was just floored by the beauty of the place. Uh, and then the distressing news lately of, of the, the largest pasture land fire that the islands of Hawaii have ever suffered, which occurred very recently, burned 64 square miles and killed 100 animals there. But uh, cowboy culture of the Paniolos is from hundreds of years ago. De Soto, um, yeah, let's go to the next slide. And we see the particular location as um, it, it looked like, as our management has told us, we should uh, be careful about copyright violations and not committing these crimes. This is the first show that uh, acquired a lot more work because we, uh, in this case here, went to the... Uh, on a Kea beach, and now I already said what the, I stole the show of the show, but we get to that soon anyway. So this is the archive collection from the from the from the building from the hotel we're going to talk about that donated this uh, this this image to you. And so this is one of the rare pictures, and you probably would have something similar to Soto, but this time we got it from their source. Mm -hmm. This is the situation where it looks like almost untouched land, right? And you guys tell us more where and 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 why that was. Well, the name of this place in Hawaiian is Kaunaoa Beach. And as you can see, it is on a, it's a very arid area. It's very dry. It's very sunny, which is nice for a resort hotel. Can be quite hot. Beautiful, wide, white sand beach. And a lot of scrub trees around it, kiabi trees, um, which are thorny and not particularly wonderful to be around. Very little in the, in the infrastructure that was already there. This was a coastline that there, there are roads. There were roads to this site, but they were not massive paved roads. It was very underutilized. There were not a lot of people who went there. Um, my family used to visit by going there by boat in the 50s and 60s before the hotel was built. That's how we got there. So it is um, remote but it had a tremendous amount of promise as a location for a resort hotel. Yeah, there was barely any, any infra, there's only these tiny little dirt roads, right? There wasn't really any infrastructure in place. And I think if I remember correctly, and Don Hibbert, with whom you have worked with extensively, uh, Ron, that's how you got to know each other about his book, um, Designing Paradise, he points out in there that you know the, the, the state and the developer Slash the client made this deal that the, the, the state was chipping in and basically helping out with the infrastructure going there. And the way also the rumors say, or the, the history is that uh, basically the, 
the islands in whatever capacity of authorities basically lured the potential client to this place and let him vacation there. And as you, Ron, said, you know, you experienced it yourself as one of the most beautiful places in Hawaii. So he must have thought and was to be convinced to build something there. And that gets us to the next slide, because this is the gentleman uh, that got uh, convinced to do that. And this is Lawrence S. Rockefeller. And we see him here. Um, and on the bottom right picture, just for the show, you discovered someone talking about your family who got there by boat, and you just spotted one of your family members there. So. That is correct. That is correct. And this brings us up to a, a interesting point about the hotel. Lawrence Rockefeller was uh, obviously an entrepreneur, very wealthy, extremely wealthy Rockefeller family, which we'll talk about a little bit more. And he had already developed some boutique destination resort hotels in other warm places. This was another place that he was being enticed to come to. But one of the crucial aspects was, and he, he said, if he could not build a golf course along with the hotel, the project would not go through. So the picture you're looking at here is a discussion about the golf course. And in the center is Robert Trent Jones, who was a very famous golf course designer, architect. He's looking at plans in this uh, staged publicity picture, Lawrence Rockefeller on the right. And then on the left is my uncle, Kenny Brown. Um, I'm not exactly sure why he was there. He was involved in the government. He was involved in development. He also was a golfer himself. So that must be and, the reason. And he was trained as an architect. And he had been, a, he was trained as an architect, although he very rarely practiced. Yeah. So he's there discussing all the plans with the bigwigs for this project as it was getting underway. Yeah, and, and looking at climate and culture, you are what you wear. There is three guys who are inappropriately dressed with long pants. And your uncle, of course, is one of the two <laughs> who have the easy breezy shorts on, right? right. And That's Rockefeller, right. in all respect, on the left, and this is probably not in Hawaii, but he is very formally dressed and not very much for the climate here. So let's start to wonder a little bit why, uh, who he commissioned as the architect. And I have to say, semester starting, I always tell the emerging generation, yes, you need to be a good architect, of course. That's why we do all this with you and for you. But we also should educate future clients because, you know, you can, you can build, um, you know, uh, good architecture never without a good client. So you need almost the client more desperately than, than the architect. And so here, who did he choose? And that gets us to the next slide. And who do we associate spontaneously architecturally with the name Rockefeller guys? Well, we associate Rockefeller Center with the, uh, the name Rockefeller. And Rockefeller Center is a shining, wonderful example of architecture located in New York City. And it was uh, put under development, got started in developing um, right at the beginning of the Great Depression, at the beginning of the 1930s. And it got a tremendous amount of publicity at the time for being such a beacon of hope of a business, a successful business uh, endeavor getting started in the face of this terrible economic situation. And Rockefeller Center is incredibly significant because one, it was an integrated large development that was put together coherently on a large plot in the most dense city in the United States. Two, it was um, designed again coherently, but also with a lot of outdoor spaces for pedestrians, with the addition of a lot of major pieces of art. So the Rockefellers didn't just build buildings, they commissioned art. And the art was a big part of the entire ambience of the entire development. And it is a masterful development for its time. Also the way they integrated all of the infrastructure, uh, underground parking, very, very far, cited and very innovative, particularly for the time in which it was built. And Ron, yep. share with us the architect. Yeah, uh, it's no surprise that, uh, that Rock, Rockefeller was such a patron of urbanity and of the arts that it's no surprise that he created what 
is the most well-designed. It's certainly the most lively, and it's the most well-loved sort of urban complex in the U.S. Everybody knows of it. Uh, if foreigners overseas recognize photographs of it. And talk about large, 22 acres and 19 commercial buildings, every one of which was uh, designed, uh, was commissioned by the Rockefeller family. Uh, the most important buildings were designed in both modern and an art deco architectural style by the famous twosome of Raymond Hood and Wallace Harrison. And this, is, this creates the very centerpiece of New York's Manhattan. Yeah, and per the reminder of copyright obeying by our boss, um, we also digging out, if, we, if any possible we have, I was digging out my own photographs. So these are by me about a decade ago where the University of Sharjah was interested in me and um, sort of a little bit suspiciously didn't fly me out to Sharjah and we get to the Arab world in the next slide. Uh, but the Dean visited me in halfway, we could say to, I guess, explain that <laughs> uh, in New York City. And, and that was too suspicious for me. So it didn't cut it for me. And luckily <laughs> I didn't go for it. So I'm here. But also we, we said the sort of pioneering aspect, maybe that's a similarity to, again, beginning of the 60s, just statehood and the Hawaiian Islands pretty much, at least in today's terms, pretty much undeveloped, right? So what Rockefeller Center was for New York City became for New York City, certainly the Mauna Kea in the typology of hospitality design became for the Hawaiian Islands. And as you pointed out, Ron, and we will prove later on, we have to add that to the show from something that you gave me a long time ago. I need to re-edit back in, even in the world, as far, as far as the ranking. So let's go to the next slide, continue our detective work um, to basically uh, look at, oh, this is not the next, the previous slide, please. So uh, number six, yeah, this one here. So thanks to Don Hibbert, who is uh, um, the author of the book, How You Got to Know Each Other, Ron, more closely, Designing Paradise, where it was excessive coverage, rightly so, about your guys' work. Um, he was also reporting on that project, of course, and was uh, saying that originally a Warnicke had been, uh, uh, you know, pre-selected to do the job. And talking sort of what, what you guys, Ron, you know, once you did the Kahala, uh, basically, and that was the precedent for the for the coming project, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, if you have worked in a certain typology, um, that gives you credibility and uh, gives you more jobs. So, Warnicke really having created this beacon of uh, easy breezy tropical exotic, the capital which we see down there with Don Hibbert and Will Bruder visiting that, and up there we see a show quote with uh, Richard Lowe, who has been working with Warnicke would have been perfect, but uh, oddly enough, they were not chosen, but the firm of Skidmore Owings Merrill was chosen. And that one is shown on the right side of this page here. And the bottom picture is something that uh, my students and I dearly miss, which is uh, doing quick trips uh, to other important places, at least you know, on the continental US and from uh, Lincoln, Nebraska to, um, Chicago, Illinois, so heading your hometown direction, Ron, is, you know, only, you know, short nine hours. And you can drive that in a car if you want, if you can't fly, which we have issues with these days, as I just found out, again, rubbing my wounds, licking my wounds, you know, being fully vaccinated and PCR tested and still being confined. Uh, you know, then you could drive, you know, with few people in the car, the windows open or whatever, right? So we drove to Chicago, visited the firm of Skidmore Owings Merrill. You see their big model, reminds me of your model maker guy, uh, Ron, your partner, Larry Stricker, who did the in-house model. They had made this model of their city of Chicago because that's the Chicago branch. And the most prominent project you see down there, one is in the foreground, which is the Sears Tower, formerly now called Willie's Tower. And you can see the Hancock building uh, in the distance, which is this sort of uh, tapered uh, or battered building, building in the back. And that gets us to the show quote uh, on, on the top right. But before that, I have to say, I have to share a little bit this sort of intel. When we were in the firm, they proudly showed us their current work on the table. And you guys uh, promised me to stay seated for that because it's rather kind of shocking story. 
because the most spectacular projects they thought they had on the table was one, the Burj Khalifa, the tallest tower in the Arab desert, that they showed us all the big sucker of construction documents. And we said, well, what's the concept of the building? And they said, oh, it's a desert rose. And we got our scan and said, oh, explain. How does it perform bioclimatically, of course, at its best, like a desert flower? They said, no, no, it just looks like one. You're like, oh my God, this is postmodernism at its worst. But it got worse than that because the second project was the Trump Tower. <laughs> that was supposed to block um, East van der Rohe's, um, you know, um, IBM building. And we, again, didn't give up hope and said, what's the concept? And said, well, we go up so many floors and then we step back because there's a neighboring building and so on and so on and so on. We're like, oh my God, this is like, you know, zoning 1930s. And so what's the concept? No, that's the concept. Oh, and then also to add on, they said, well, we had some really cool design. These are these uh, uh, glass fins. We clip on the mullions of the, of, the, of the facade and that will look really cool. And then stupid Trump, Value engineered that away. And we're like, oh, that's a big surprise, right? Because Trump is a very cultivated guy, right? Why would he do that? So anyways, to, we're probably getting close to the end of the show. So I, we use it to rehabilitate SOM because next time I went to see them with during my desert day in my uh, Arizona job, we basically had a German guy tour uh, the, uh, the office and um, I asked him sort of, pulled him aside and I said, hey, why are you here? And he basically said, oh, there's one project by this firm that really is one of my most favorite projects ever in the world. And it's in the desert too, from the eighties. And that's why I'm here. So that was a sign of hope. And ever since they've been doing better work and we closed the show with a little pre glimpse, uh, Ron, because we don't have much time about what that project is in the desert in Jeddah by SOM. Yeah, it was actually a, a commercial bank building in, in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, an incredible 27-story triangular block that had enormous openings in its uh, otherwise blank facades and a 27-story atrium. And uh, because of that, uh, air updrafts cooled off this building considerably. The section of it is really exciting. It was an easy, breezy desert building. And, and we see that it's the second for the audience, the second uh, column to the right, what we see zoomed in, thanks to Michael. Now. Yeah, and what I should say is that uh, there's no surprise that Rockefeller would select SOM back in the 60s and 70s. At that time, this very large corporate firm was turning out nothing but humane uh, and handsome uh, urbane buildings all over the world, one after the other. And... Uh, when uh, Rockefeller decided an SOM, he went to the San Francisco office of SOM and the designer, Charles Bassett. And in the next slide, either now or next week, we'll finally see the Mauna Kea Beach Hotel in its easy breezy section. Exactly, that's the perfect closing note, Ron. We will do a little bit more detective work until we get there. And until then, I can only stay, stay very local, right? Yeah. Act local while thinking global. Yeah. I know where I'm coming from. I do. And, and not going anywhere. As <laughs> no, not going anywhere. <laughs> All right. Bye. See you guys next week for that. Look forward to. Bye-bye. <laughs>